I'd now like to welcome to the show former Dallas Cowboy head coach and Connecticut's own Dave Campo. Dave, welcome to Talking Sports with the Bird. How you doing? I'm doing great, John. How's it going? How's the weather back there? Eight degrees. Listen, my father... <laughs> My father's 99 years old, still lives in Mystic, and he's telling me all the time how miserable the weather is back there. So I want to make sure you're okay back there. Well, why don't you get him down with you down in Plano, Texas? My God, it's, all, it's a lot better than what it is up here. It's about 12 up here. I'm trying to, but he just he just uh, is not doesn't want to go away from his roots. He's actually going to come with us this year. So, That's good. Uh, That's good. We'll get them down eventually. I'm looking at your stuff. Coaching for over 40 years. You coach for over 40 years. That's unbelievable to me. You gotta love the love you must have for coaching, and you must have a re- you must have had a real or have a real supportive family to go with all well, these different changes you had. Yeah, you know that's one of the things that that people don't really realize. Uh, you know, my wife has been uh, wonderful about moving. The best thing that ever happened to us, though, was when we went to the Dallas Cowboys the first time in, in 1989. We were there for 14 years, John. Yep. So all my kids went through the same high school, graduated from the same high school, and that's very uh, unusual in the in the uh, football business, uh, sports business in general. And we were fortunate there, but you have to have a wife that's an independent person that can kind of handle her own uh, business because uh, the hours are, are are not real good. I can imagine. Listen to former Dallas head coach Dave Campo. Now we know you played at Central Connecticut, but we're here in Bridgeport. I'm looking at the resume. You spent one year at UB, and when I tell Absolutely. people that, and my friend Matt Rialli, who I know was listening, he's the one that broke this to me. I was shocked to read that. Talk about your experience. I know it was a long time ago, but your experience in Bridgeport. I mean, you are a Connecticut guy, but one year in Bridgeport. I love the University of Bridgeport, and I'll tell you why. They were a Division Three program who were very successful uh, prior to, to Ray Murphy getting the head job there, and me ended up with him. And uh, they, they won the, what they called the Boardwalk Bowl a couple times, uh, which was like the national championship in Division Three. The thing I loved about them is they were a lot of tough kids, outstanding athletic kids, but they were an inch too short or an in, or a, a, a second too slow to play in Division I football. As a matter of fact, when Bridgeport dropped football, I was hired to stay there and to help the kids transfer because they could transfer uh, immediately. And uh, one of the guys I had was Nick Giaquino. Oh, yes. Who ended up going, uh, getting into the University of Connecticut and played about nine years with the Washington Redskins. So those were the type of athletes we had, and they were just tough Loved the game of football. They were there without, they were on a partial scholarships. So they were having to work sometimes in between playing ball. It was just a great experience. And it's funny, I've been doing the show for 17 years, Dave, and Nick was one of my first guests. He just, matter of fact, Nick just retired from Sacred Heart. He was the baseball coach there for a number right. of years. I don't know if you know Bobby Valentine's the AD here at Sacred Heart, and Nick just left. Uh, I think this was his last year, so that's just funny you bring him up. Yeah, well, can, can I tell you a funny story? Yeah. When I was uh, the head coach of the Dallas Cowboys, uh, and, and I'm getting old now because I'm probably going to forget what I'm telling you, but... <laughs> Uh, Bob Zuffalato was assistant coach with the, the Dallas Mavericks. He was the uh, assistant basketball coach at Central Connecticut when I was there. Bobby Valentine was the head baseball coach of the Rangers. And uh, Tommy Penders was the wow. head coach at the University of Texas. All those guys from Connecticut Amazing. And, and down in the Dallas area. It was unbelievable. Unbelievable. Listen to Dave Campo. Now, you go to Miami. You talked about, you know, you spent 14 years in Florida, but the stop before was at the University of Miami where you coached under Jimmy Johnson, who I believe came from Oklahoma State. You saw, yeah. you saw now, the stuff that was in my, you were there in Miami for two years. You won a national championship there. I don't know if you saw the 30 for 30 thing on ESPN about Miami. I was in it. I know that. <laughs> was it accurate? Well, How crazy was the time down there in Miami with the players? Well, you know, uh, Miami Vice was the big show on TV, so that ought to give you some indication <laughs> of what, what Miami was like. But I'll be honest with you, that was probably my favorite job of any job I've ever had because all of the kids that were there 
were kids that a lot of them came from underprivileged families. Uh, they were, you know, kids that just loved the game of football. They had a tremendous love for and wanted to be successful. And a lot of the things that happened there were, were little things that were kind of blown out of proportion. Like uh, a guy uh, tries to stop a guy from driving on campus and the guy drives over the policeman's foot. Stuff like that, you know. And, and you know, while not, you know, not the right thing to do, but at the same time, they kind of made us look out, look like convicts down there. And in reality, it wasn't quite that bad. Okay. We had some outstanding football players that just loved to play football, and, and it was just a fun time. Jimmy Johnson's persona was perfect for University of Miami. Talk about that. Now, you coached, you know, you coached under him in Miami, and you coached, you coached under him at Dallas before Switzer came in, and we'll talk about that. But his persona for Miami was perfect for that team, that city, and that time, correct? Yes, he was, he was kind of a different guy, you know, and, and he, he loved his players. You know, he wasn't a tremendous ex as an old man. He was uh, a psychologist. That was his, that was his uh, college degree and really was a genius IQ. And so he knew how to handle people. He knew how to handle different kinds of people. And people didn't realize this, but... You know, a lot of people said he, he ruled in fear, which he did a little bit. You know, people were a little bit scared of him. They didn't know exactly what, they, what he was going to do. But he knew his players better than any coach I've ever been around. And he did it individually by just going up and talking to them, getting to know them. And he was smart enough to, to understand how to motivate these guys. And he was perfect, perfect for Miami because he had that flamboyant, you know, he didn't really care too much of what guys looked like. It's how they played, what their results were. And that was big with those kids in Miami and in Dallas. You guys leave Miami, you come to Dallas. And it was right around the time where Jerry bought the team and Tom Landry was still there talking about not flamboyant. That transition when, you know, and, and Jerry will go back now, he'll say that it was, it was awkwardly handled. Talk about that transition when to try and get Tom Landry out and to bring the new regime in when Jerry took over the team. Well, it was difficult because, you know, obviously Coach Landry uh, was an icon in, in, in professional football as a player and as a coach. And, you know, Jerry, being an oil and gas man, probably didn't handle, you know, the an oil and gas man does his deals by shaking hands. And he could have let Coach Landry go uh, without having to go uh, down there to, the, to uh, Austin. But he actually wanted to talk to him in person, and everybody looked, looked at that as like he was showing off, you know, that he was going to come in and get rid of Coach Landry. Yep. So it started out a little bit shaky. And we had some players from that era that didn't really take to us as well. You know, that first year, uh, we had to let uh, Randy White go, Danny White. Those guys that were great. But we had a couple guys on the ball club that really didn't conform. And they only stayed there one year, and then they were gone. Uh, and, and it was a difficult first year. But once the Herschel Walker trade was made, everything changed, and <laughs> it, it became a little bit easier. Without a doubt. You listen to Dave Campbell, former head coach of the Dallas Cowboys. And, Dave, you do some work with the Cowboys now in a post-game show, right? After every home game, you still work, not work with them, but you're still, you're still around the team, and you basically analyze and talk about them every week, no? Yes, that's, that's the best part of it. You know, you say I had a 44-year coaching career. Well, now I get to be around the team. Uh, get to, uh, you know, uh, feel like I'm still part of the organization, which actually I am because I'm working uh, with three of the shows with uh, Dallas Cowboy TV. Yep. Uh, so I'm still really part of the organization, but I'm not getting my stomach torn out every <laughs> Sunday. I've, I've, actually, I've actually become what you, I guess you would call a super fan. Yep. You know, I, I get a chance to analyze, and, and I'm doing two shows with Channel 11, CBS here in, in Dallas as well, and... Uh, you know, it's really fun because, uh, you know, I feel like I still have a lot to, to, to talk about uh, football-wise, and it gives me a chance to do that and, and still be close to everything that's going on. You're like Dick Vitale. What he always says, I'm undefeated and I'm enjoying myself and they're paying me to do it. You can't go wrong it's with that. It's unbelievable. I always <laughs> thought I'd never work. I, I, this is no disrespect, John, but I never 
I never thought I worked a day as a football coach. I feel like as a media guy, I only work half a day. <laughs> There's no disrespect. I agree with you. <laughs> now, Dave, you did, before you became head coach of the Cowboys, you did most of your work was on the defensive end. And when you look at some of the players that came through in that 14-year period, and I know you were a defensive guy, I want to start with the offensive side because, you know, going to modern-day Cowboys now, when I look at the Cowboy line today, you were involved, again, on the defensive side, but the offensive line of the Cowboys, when I bring up Eric Williams and Larry Allen and the late Mark Tuane and Stepnoski and Big Nate Newton, the one knock that Emmett Smith gets is you could have put anybody behind that line. Now, I know you're pretty tight with Emmett. Talk about how much, how unfair that is and how much it probably bothers Emmett to hear that. Well, I don't think it bothers him at all because I think he would have to agree. You know, the, you're only as good as, as, as your front in, on both offense and defense. And the line, you know, it's interesting because the line that the Cowboys have right now is, is very similar to, to that group. Right. The, the only difference is that the, the, the line that we had in the 90s were road graders. <laughs> Those guys just came off the ball and hit you in the mouth and just took you. Whereas this line that the Cowboys have right now are more athletic. You see them pulling more, getting out on the perimeter. But they are a physical offensive line. Emmett would say right now that, that uh, he owes uh, most of his success to the guys that were up front and were willing to, to do the dirty work for him. But it, it works together, John. You know, the, a, a good offensive line makes uh, a back good, and a good back makes the offensive line good, too, because they don't have to wait too long on those blocks. So it's it's a combination of both. I guess let me word it a little differently. I know I know he would say that, but when people talk, the casual fan talks about the best back I've ever seen. Obviously, Jim Brown always comes up. It's OJ. It's Barry Sanders. Emmett Smith very rarely gets mentioned. That's kind of what I mean about. I'm not saying he's not going to deny he was helped by that line, but does it bother him that he's really not mentioned in the top five when people bring those lists up? You know, I really don't think so, John, because I think that uh, the one thing that he can say that, that a couple of those other guys can't, he's got three Super Bowl rings, <laughs> and he has the, the uh, uh, career rushing record, which was one of the highlights of my head coaching. I didn't have many, but that was one of my highlights as a head coach was I was there when he, when he broke that record. And uh, I think that Emmett is a really solid guy. I think he gets his props. And... You know, I think he realizes that it's a it's a two way street there. You know, Dave, a lot of the story up here this week with the Giants losing to the Packers and Odell Beckham and all the receivers hanging out on the boat. You you knew how that story was going to play out in the New York media if the game didn't turn out in favor of the Giants. You had a guy back then, Michael Irvin. I'm not comparing the two, the success that Irvin's had, but he had some wild times. But Michael Irvin showed up every Sunday and did not put on a performance that Odell Beckham did this past Sunday. How do you think Jimmy Johnson or yourself would have handled the Odell Beckham situation, taking his day off and going on the boat, and then the, you know, the results are what the results are? Well, you know, we were a lot alike in, in, in the, in the, uh, from the standpoint, Jimmy and I, uh, that we had a ladder system. And where you ranked on that ladder, that ladder, whatever rung you were on, if you were at the bottom of the rung, you know, bottom of the ladder, and you did something stupid, you were out of there. If you were in the middle, you had a little bit of leeway. But if you were at the top rung and your production was there, then you had a lot more leeway in what you could do. Now, we had a situation here uh, in Dallas with uh, Tony Romo and Jason Witten going to Cabo in 2007 yep. at, during the bye week and then lost to the Giants in the, in the uh, divisional round. And, and that was blown up. And, and my feeling is this. Michael Irvin was, was a, a character, but he was never disruptive on the football field. As a matter of fact, if I were to uh, start a football team today, the first person I'd start it with is Michael Irvin. Wow. Because he was the hardest practicing, the most dedicated, the best team player I've ever been around. I don't see Odell Beckham Jr. in that light right now. I see him as a productive player, 
but he's very, very immature. And, and he would have been in my office or Jimmy's office a bunch talking about you need to grow up. And I think the general manager of the Giants just said that to him this week. Yeah, well, it would have been said to him a lot of times before, before this week. And there was no question when they went down there, it's all perception. I'm not sure that has anything to do with whether or not they play good or not. I think the Colts probably had more to do with his so-so game, yeah. you know, against Green Bay than, than whether or not he went to, to uh, Miami. But the perception is you're not doing everything that it takes to uh, give yourself to, you know, a chance to have the best game to win the football game. Before I get to some of the individual guys that you coached on defense, you listen to Dave Campbell, former head coach of the Dallas Cowboys. Two guys, I'm a, I'm a Raider fan, I'm a silver and black fan, so I want to talk about two guys, Jack Del Rio and Ken Norton Jr. They just announced today that the Raiders are going to keep Ken Norton Jr. as the defensive coordinator, and obviously Del Rio is going to keep his job. It was lousy the way it ended with Derek Carr breaking his foot. But Jack Del Rio is interesting because you not only coached him, but then you coached under him when you went to Jacksonville. Talk about those two players, and are you surprised that they're having the coaching success that they're having now? Well, I'm not really at all, because both of them were uh, what I call cerebral players. Uh, they were guys that studied uh, you know, everything. They knew their job. They knew what they had to do. Uh, Kenny Norton was a little bit better player than Jack, but Jack was a tough, you know, smart inside linebacker. He was a guy that did a lot because of his intelligence and what he was going to, you know, how he was going to do things. And, you know, they both turned out to be that type of a guy. And you can usually see, you know, when you're coaching guys, the guys that have a chance to be coaches in the future, because they're, they're guys that, that uh, are just uh, Sean Lee, for example, a linebacker that the Cowboys have right now. Yep. He'll be an outstanding football coach because that's, he lives and breathes it. And that's the kind of guy though both of those guys were. Kenny Norton was a little bit better athlete and flamboyant, but Jack was a, a cerebral guy that understood the game plan and understood the, the teams he was playing against. So I'm not surprised at all. In fact, the offensive coordinator at uh, the Raiders, and I'm, I'm shocked. Somebody just told me that Jack let him go. I don't know why you would do that. Today, yeah, today. Yeah. Uh, that, that was a shock. But Bill Musgrave was played for us with the Cowboys as well. And he was the same kind of a guy. He was a quarterback, you know, a backup quarterback. So, you know, those three guys were all guys that I felt. And, and some guys don't ever do that, uh, John, because they made so much money as players. They don't want to go downhill getting coaches money. <laughs> exactly. Listen to Dave Campo. Couple more for you, Dave. Charles Haley. I know you. When you started with the Cowboys, you were a defensive assistant. Then you went to defensive backs coach, and then you were the defensive coordinator. And I mentioned early on the show, four of the five years you had a top ten defense. My question is, as a defensive backs coach, when a guy like Charles Haley comes in and joins your defensive line, I'm not saying it makes your job easier, but how does your job change as the coach of the defensive back when you got a disruptive pass rusher like Charles Haley joining the team? Well, I'm gonna I'm 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 gonna say that you you shouldn't say you're not gonna say that it is a difference maker <laughs> because it is. There's no question about it. In 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 the time that we were there, the the thing that put us over the top on defense, which really gave us a chance to win the Super Bowl, because you know everybody talks about the uh, triplets. You know and that's you know the offense of Jay Novacek and the offensive line. Really, you don't win a, a, a Super Bowl without having a productive defense in the playoffs. And the thing that put us over the top was Charles Haley. You know, when an offense has to take care of one guy with, with, with their constant concern and knowing where he is, that opens it up for everybody else. And that opened it up for the Tony Tolberts and the Jeff Coates and the guys coming off the other side. And once you get pressure on the quarterback... That makes the job a heck of a lot easier in the secondary, and that's why we turned the ball over quite a bit on defense and uh, was a big, big factor in, in, in winning a bunch of Super Bowls. Another name people will know is Deion Sanders. He joins the team in 1995. At that point, you're a defensive coordinator. Talk about his addition, another big-time personality, but all you ever hear is how hard the guy worked. 
Talk about what a difference maker he was, not only with Dallas, but when he went to San Fran, wherever he went. Talk about Dion well, and coaching him. Well, I'm going to give you a couple stories on that one if we have the time. Yep. Do we have the time? Of course we okay. do. For Dion, we got the time. And okay. for you. <laughs> yeah. Well, here's the first one. We're, at, we're in Mexico City playing in the American Bowl uh, in uh, 1994. And Jerry Jones came up. Butch Davis was a coordinator, and I was a secondary coach. And Jerry came up and said, guys, uh, Deion Sanders is going to play football. And he's going to play at the end of the baseball season. Do we want Deion Sanders in after the seventh game? And, you know, I thought about it for a minute, and I said, you know, Jerry, we've got a great DB rule. And the only thing I really knew about Deion was that he was a, a, a larger-than-life kind of a guy. So I said, well, you know, the only thing I'm concerned about, I really didn't know him as a player, but I said, I'd hate to disrupt the chemistry. We just came off of winning two Super Bowls. <laughs> and so, you know, I was a little concerned. I said, I don't know. Well, we let him go to San Francisco, and then he arm bars Michael Urban and keeps us from coming back and winning the NFC Championship game. And he wins. You know, they win the Super Bowl. Yep. That taught me a valuable lesson. Don't ever let a great – if you got a chance to get a great athlete, get him. That's the first story. <laughs> the second story is he joins us. We're getting ready to play Atlanta on the bye week. He joins us during the bye week the next year. We, we, we sign him. And we were something like 6-1 and one at the time, I think. And we're in a walkthrough. You know, it was the bye week, so we, we weren't into regular practice yet. We were doing walkthroughs. And we were a pretty sophisticated defense. When there was a lot of motions and stuff, we moved around. We changed coverages and doing some of that stuff. So we're in the walkthrough, and he's now I'm the defensive coordinator. And he's trying to figure out what we're doing. And he gets about halfway through the walkthrough, and he looked at me and he goes, Coach, just tell me who I cover. <laughs> So I, if I'd have been a, 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 a you know, a, a knucklehead, I would have said, shut up and let's just, we'll get it. we will get it. Just keep working. But I stopped for a minute and I gave a little time for thought to kick in. <laughs> and, and, and I said, okay, guys, that's it. We're done. And I took Mike Zimmer, who was the secondary coach, yep. and he and I went in and during lunch, we put together the package where Dion covered the second receiver and we doubled the first receiver all the time. And that's, we went on to win the Super Bowl. And it taught me a valuable lesson. You got to listen sometimes. You don't, you don't have all the answers all the time. The best leaders are the ones that do the best listening. Very, in very interesting. Very, very well said, Dave Campbell. Talk about a couple more for you because we're up against it here. You've made comments about Jerry Jones that he's that he's changed over the years. Talk about that, and then talk about what really went behind. Were you shocked after back-to-back -back Super Bowls that Jerry and Jimmy really couldn't see eye-to-eye? -eye? And what was the big personality change when Barry Switzer came in to replace Jimmy Johnson? Well, first of all, you know, Jerry learned a lot. I mean, you know, coming in, he really, you know, he played football, but, you know, as a player, you don't really get the the idea of, how everything works in the game and he really actually he has so much confidence in himself john that he truly believed that he could do anything you know in other words when he made the comment that 500 guys could have coached the cowboys <laughs> when when he let jimmy go yep. he really believed it yep. he thought you know well you know if you're a leader and you're a a, 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 a top businessman and, and 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 you're a deal maker you can do anything. And I think over the years, he's learned. And when he took over, you know, he, he really bought the team against everybody's, you know, all of his friends told him not to do it because they were in debt. Mm. But he, he bought the team so that he could be actively involved. And, and I think he became a little bit too actively involved with, you know, being a micromanager. And he's learned over the years that now he, he doesn't do that anywhere near as much. He... He's in active in the scouting and the general manager part of it, but uh, he's letting Jason Garrett do a lot of this, and I think he's learned that over the years. Now, I was not surprised that the two 
Jimmy and Jerry collided because they were they were two. It, it's sort of like uh, Kiffin and yeah, and Saban. Saban. Yep, two head coaches that both know it all, <laughs> and they neither one of them wanted to concede to the other one when it really came down to it. I don't know if you remember the. The, the one Super Bowl where Jimmy, they handed Jimmy the trophy. Yeah, and he took it from him. And, and Jerry took it right out of his hand. I remember that, yes. And that to an ego guy like Jimmy, who <laughs> felt that he did 90% of what got us to the Super Bowl. And Jerry felt that I'm the boss. He didn't do anything unless I allowed him to do it. Exactly. So they just, they just collided. It didn't surprise me. It really didn't. And it's unfortunate because I think we would have won maybe at least one more. And that's not taking anything away from Barry because Barry Switzer is one of my favorite guys. Speaking of one more, there's a lot of Cowboy fans. We've got a couple more before we get you out of here. A couple more. There's a lot of Dallas fans. Talk about present-day Cowboys. Are you amazed by what Dak Prescott as a rookie quarterback is doing? And talk about the humility of Tony Romo and how tough this year has been for him. Probably the best team he's going to be on, and he can't even get on the field. Yeah, it's really, uh, it's been a difficult year for Tony, and I'll speak to him first, you know. Uh, I was fortunate enough to come back here, you know, as an assistant in 2008. So I I was with him 8, 9, 10, and 11. Yep. And that's that was my, you know, he came the year after I left. Uh, he came in with Coach Parcells. So uh, I had a chance to know him and get around him. I have his number in my phone. Uh, we had a good relationship, and I really loved the young man. And he didn't have to do what he did. He didn't have to go on on record and saying what he did in that press conference. And uh, it's because he truly understands that. And when he said that you earn what you get in football, there's no question he, Dak Prescott earned the right to be the guy going forward. And as far as Dak Prescott is concerned, he is just an unbelievable young man. If you want a role model, that's the guy you want. If you're going to use an athlete as a role model, he, he's he's poised, he's confident. He showed that right away. We, I did a, I actually did the broadcast of the Seattle preseason game, and he had a two minute drill at the end of that. And it's really the first time I'd really looked at him strongly. And Seattle was coming after him, and they hit him a couple times. He drove him the length of the field, and with 10 seconds left, he took his time, and he clocked the football, and they kicked the field goal. That was the first time I said to, to Babe Laufenberg, who was up there with me, this kid's something special. He's got something. I didn't know he was going to do what he did, but he has just done a tremendous job of staying in the moment and understanding that it's game to game, which is the mantra of Jason Garrett. Well, you don't have to go game to game. Last one. What's your prediction for this coming Sunday? Do you think the Dallas run game keeps Aaron Rodgers? You're a defensive coordinator. How are you defending Aaron Rodgers? Well, first of all, you don't want to get into, uh, number one, the best defense against Aaron Rodgers is to control the ball yep. and control the ball game. Keep him off the field. I don't really want any part of Darryl, uh, of uh, Rodgers with, with the way he's playing right now. But the way to defend him is you don't want to get into too many man-to-man, one-on-one situations when you're playing it. Because as soon as he sees the, the back of, a, a, of DB's jersey, even though he may be covering pretty good, he's going to stick it in there. And he, he really controls what happens with the pass rushes, the way he moves around. So really what you have to do is you have to get pressure up the middle on him, control rush the ends, and then the outside guy, the, the, the secondary, has got to keep everything in front of them. Don't give them a chance to get a bunch of chunk plays. And that's the only chance you've got. But I really think the control of the game is going to be the key, and I'm picking the Cowboys. I'm not surprised. <laughs> hey, Dave, man, I, I really appreciate all the time. My friend Matt Reale wants me to mention the Center for Family Justice golf out. you got to keep June 19th open. I guess Matt ran your golf outing with Darren Woodson back he in the did. day, and he wants you to be. He told me you're a great guest, and I man, he was not lying. Half an hour with the Birdman, you gave a lot of knowledge. There's a lot of Cowboy fans out here, and you shared a lot of memories of the early 90s. I want to thank you. I want to keep June 
June 19th open for this golf tournament. If you're up in the area, if your father wants to play some golf, that'll get you up here. Yeah, <laughs> the weather's nicer here in the summer. You know it that. Is. <laughs> hey. It is. It's, and John, thank you very much. I enjoy being on with the uh, with my folks in Connecticut. Perfect. Uh, we enjoy having you, Dave. Thank you so much. All right, John. And tell Matt I said hello, and, and I'll talk to him. I will do. Take care, Dave. Thank you.